good evening everyone. It's great to have you back uh, this time of the year as normally Easter and breaks like that. So uh, it's been a bit stop-start in terms of this second module. Uh, but here we are back to roll again, lecture number two. We will tonight finish lecture number one, which I didn't finish in the first lecture, uh, the, the Pentateuch, and then we'll get into the historical books after that. As we start, a few thoughts from the book of Joshua, which is one of the books that we'll be looking at tonight. Joshua chapter 1, verse 1. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I am about to give to them, to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country to the great sea on the west. No one will be able to stand up against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so it will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land. I swore to their forefathers to give to them. Just a couple of thoughts from this uh, particular reading. The first is that we're looking at transition. And that is, up to this point in time, the people have followed Moses. They have lived in the desert for about 40 years. Uh, the generation that left Egypt, that particular generation is gone. The people are now the younger people, those who were... Uh, toddlers and teenagers and all the way up to the year 20 or so, 20 years of age, they have grown up. They must be uh, 60 and 50 and 40 years old and younger people have been born in the desert. Uh, so the majority of them only really knew the desert and they knew Moses. And so we're now looking at transition. And it's interesting how the Lord comes to Joshua and he's, he's very straight, no euphemism here. He says, Moses, my servant, is dead. Not he passed away, you know, pat on the back or anything like that. Simply straightforward, shooting straight. It's, it's reality. Things are going to change. Things will not be as they used to be. You're going to move on, is essentially what God is saying to Joshua. The, the second thing that I want to highlight, you don't necessarily find in this passage, but it's all over the Bible and in the Old Testament that we are studying in this module. And that is the faithfulness of God. The date is roughly 1200. We'll look at that um, a, a little bit later on. God called Abraham about 2,000 years before. 2,000 years before um, Christ. In other words, 800 years or so before this particular event. So if you were an Israelite, you would have all the right to say, but where is God? Uh, is he actually faithful? Has he, has he forgotten us? I'm sure the 400 years of slavery uh, in Egypt must have raised many of those questions. But as we come to understand God in the Bible, you find God being faithful to his promises. It may take him a while, and, and that's where I struggle because I only live one single life. I have hindsight, but I don't have sight into the future to know when and how God is going to fulfill His promises. I'm sure many people in the years gone by, in the 800 years before this particular event, must have queried and questioned God's promise. Is God really, has He ever promised that? And if He did, was He, uh, was he serious about saying that? And, and where is He? And here God is at the point of leading the nation into the land that He promised to Abraham 800 years before. And so the faithfulness of God. The last thing I want to highlight is that God says to Joshua, it's not in your own strength. He doesn't say it in so many words. He's simply saying to him, I will be with you as I have been with Moses. In other words, he's reaching back into the 40 years of traveling through the desert. And he is saying to him, uh, Joshua, you have seen, you've been a witness as I have led Moses. And you've seen how Moses operated. And I, you have witnessed how I have been with Moses. Now I want to tell you that I will be with you. I will lead you into the future and into the promised land. 
And that, as you read through the book of Joshua and the rest, that is exactly what has happened uh, during the conquest of the land of Canaan. So a wonderful promise that we find in chapter 1 of the book of Joshua. We'll look at this in, in more detail, or the book of Joshua in more detail in a few moments' time. But as we start tonight, let's pray together. Father, we thank you for an opportunity to study, to learn, to expand our knowledge. And I pray that through the learning that we are doing in this course, through the studying of the different books in the Old Testament, that we will not only gain knowledge, but that we will gain an understanding, a deeper understanding of your word, how you revealed yourself to us, and that that in itself will draw us closer to your side, that we will come to know you better. And based on what we read over here, Lord, we have great courage to go into the future as we, as we place our hands in, into yours and as we trust you to lead us into the future. We pray for tonight for your blessing upon us, but we also pray for this whole course as we journey through the Old Testament. Give us a deeper understanding and appreciation for who you are and how you work in this world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to go back in just a moment and uh, cover the last two books of the Pentateuch. We have looked at those five books of Moses and uh, an introduction. I have spent a bit of time um, when we started in, in lecture number one, actually sketching the story of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. And part of my purpose in this course is to do exactly that, is to journey through the Bible and to, look, to read the Bible against the historical background, which we have done already. We've done quite a bit of that in the first module. In this particular module, I'm filling in some more detail as it comes to the, the different books in the Old Testament. But even more important than that is to see the overall picture of how God operates in the Bible. And, and, and therefore, starting with Genesis and creation, I don't think we will ever really, really understand salvation and understand heaven as God prepares the new earth and the new heavens, unless we understand God's purposes with creating the first one, the one that we are living in right now. And, and therefore, going back to Genesis and reading about the fall, and then reading about God's response to the fall, and then going into the Pentateuch and the calling of Abraham and Moses, and, and now we're into Joshua uh, and the rest in, in this uh, lecture tonight. And as we journey through the whole of the Old Testament, it's important to understand that as, as God's way of working, especially preparing the world for, number one, the coming of Jesus, the first coming of Jesus, and then that story continues because in the, with the second coming of Jesus, that story will culminate in the new heavens and the new earth that God is busy preparing uh, for us. And so I spend a bit of time doing that, and in doing so, uh, I have sort of maybe wasted a bit of time, and therefore I wasn't able to finish Numbers and Deuteronomy. Uh, but tonight, I just want to finish that picture in terms of the Pentateuch, and then we'll get into the historical books. The book of Numbers is not the kind of book that you necessarily uh, give to a brand new Christian to read. There are wonderful stories in the book of Numbers, uh, but there are also a bunch of numbers in the book of Numbers. The name is actually derived from uh, the Greek word arithmoi, and you will, you will recognize the word immediately from uh, arithmetic or something like that. And it, it literally means numbers, and in the Latin, the word is numeri. If you're Afrikaans speaking, you will recognize that name immediately because that is the name, the title of the book Numbers in the Afrikaans Bible uh, as well. And the first few chapters literally contain a, a list of census or genealogies and, and, and people and uh, one list of names upon the other. Um, and, and that's where the title originated. But in the Hebrew, the book is called Vayadaver, which really means, and he said, and that is the very first Hebrew word in uh, the book of Numbers. It's kind of strange to find a book by the name, and he said. So when you refer to, and he said, you are talking about, and he said, chapter 1, verse 5, sort of thing. Um, but for them, it, it wasn't anything strange, and we will pick that up again and again uh, in the Old Testament, where a book uh, had the title of the very first word in the Hebrew. Uh, 
But there are also some wonderful stories. The story of the spies sent into the land of Canaan to go and check it out, the 12 spies, and how they came back with a report, 10 of them saying, it's impossible, we can't do this. Only two of them, uh, Caleb and Joshua, who said, let's go and let's go and take the land. Uh, as a result of which, um, based on the negative report of the 10, the most of the people rebelled, they want to turn back, uh, they want to go back to Egypt, and God said, okay, well, go back into the desert. And they therefore spent the 40 years in the desert. So that's the story, one of the stories we find uh, in the book of Numbers as well. In terms of contents and division, um, chapters 1 to 4, there's this census division or numbers that, that I have mentioned. There are more laws and regulations, the kind of thing that we read. Um, and I may just need to make a, a comment, a side comment right now. When we as Christians, from a, a New Testament perspective, go back to the Old Testament, we, we don't f uh, normally find uh, many of the laws really applicable to us. And so oftentimes we, we wonder about the laws in the Old Testament. But scholars have pointed out that in the Old Testament we have what has become known as the moral laws in the Old Testament. And those laws are still valid. Most of, in fact, I believe all of the Ten Commandments are still valid for us today. Uh, they are not legalistic. Uh, they're not setting up a particular government. Uh, it's not statutes for a, a particular country. They are there given for humanity, to humanity, given to Israel, but they are applicable to everybody, and therefore they are still applicable till today. And we don't have time to go into all of those details. I even believe the Sabbath law uh, is one of those where uh, we, we can find uh, principles and guidelines for us in terms of rest, which is so important for us, uh, and I believe it's a, it's a guideline that God has put in place for us. But there are, and scholars refer to them as ceremonial laws, and those laws refer to the offerings and the sacrifices and the eating habits and, the, and, and those kind of things. And, and those laws have been either fulfilled or superseded by Jesus when he came. And therefore, they're no longer applicable to us. We read them. We find them interesting. Even there, we may find certain guidelines and principles, but they're not applicable to us in the sense that we still have to go and, and uh, function according to those laws anymore. The second Passover uh, is celebrated, and that is described in chapter 9. The first one, you will remember, was with the leaving of Egypt. That was the institution of the Passover at the time. So in chapter 9, we find the second one celebrated. And then the Israelites moved from Sinai to Kadesh Barnea in chapters 10 to 14. And that's the story of the spies. Uh, from that point on, this, the, uh, from that position on, the spies are sent into the land of Canaan. Uh, they ca came back and they turned around back into the desert, chapters 15 to 19. And then also on the plains of Moab. Uh, and Edom. So after traveling around the desert, the Sinai Peninsula, eventually they make their way around, this time not from the south straight up into Canaan, but they come from the southeastern side uh, into or approaching the land, and they find themselves in Moab uh, and Edom, and we're going to look at some of those maps a bit later on. But this is also where we find the story of Balaam. Uh, Balaam is an interesting uh, character, but here is a picture of Kadesh Barnea. There's no city anymore uh, at this particular time, but this is believed to have been the position, roughly, where the Israelites camped, and then from there they sent the spies uh, into the land. Um, and then Balaam is the interesting thing, um, and, and it's one of those mysteries that we are not able to resolve at this particular stage anymore, because we simply lack the information. But who was Balaam? Uh, it seems like when um, he was requested to come, and in, fa in fact he was paid to come and curse the Israelites, seems like there were certain people who had that ability, an ability to connect with the spiritual world. Now, of course, immediately the question is, did he speak to God, Yahweh, as we have come to understand him, or was he speaking to the other spiritual world out there? And, and that question has not been answered to us, uh, except that there are certain indications uh, in the Bible. But there are and were many prophets like that in the Old Testament. There are many such mysteries in the Old Testament where people are simply mentioned, they appear on the scene, 
no background, no sketch of, of any of the uh, entrance of this person onto the historical scene, but simply they're there, and then after that they disappear uh, once again. They may have been diviners, or people like Balaam uh, have been around. Of course, the question in my mind is, where did he even hear about God? And was there a knowledge of God beyond Israel? We seem to get that, that impression from time to time. Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek. Again, one of those mysterious figures who appear on the scene and disappears with no background and no description. But Abraham regarded him uh, as, as uh, important enough that he needed to pay some tithes to him, which is why the book of Hebrews picks up on that particular story and actually compares Jesus with Melchizedek in terms of the kind of person or position uh, that Jesus held. And so here was Balaam, the king of Moab, Balak, uh, sent some money to pay, Balak, uh, to pay Balaam to come and curse uh, the Israelites, Numbers chapter 22. Uh, Balaam's relationship with God, as I said, is one of those mysterious things, but it's very clear from the description in Numbers that um, Balaam had some kind of revelation from God. So as he approached whoever or who, whomever he wanted to approach, we're not sure. But certainly God started speaking to him. And he actually said, initially said, no, I don't, I'm not going. And then we know the story from the Sunday school uh, lessons and so on, how Balaam eventually did go, but he, he's on a donkey and a donkey speaks to him. And then as he stands there, uh, with, with uh, great pomp and so on, with all sorts of sacrifices being made. Uh, Balak is now saying, okay, there they are. You look at, at Israel in the valley there, now you need to curse them. And of course, the only words that come out are blessings. Um, and, and so God, who is able to make a donkey speak, uh, is now able to, to control the tongue of Balaam. And as Balaam wants to curse, as he has been paid to do, the only thing he's able to do is actually bless Israel. And so they move from place to place. It seems like from other bits and pieces of information that, that Balaam, as he was leaving, gave some advice to Balak, uh, which was very evil advice. And that is you need to lay on a, a party and invite some of the Israelites over. And that led the Israelites into some sinful actions. And he has always been uh, uh, blamed for that. And Joshua chapter 13 verse 22 mentions Balaam as someone who practiced divination. And so th there seems to have been those kinds of people around in the ancient world. Um, we, we look at it purely because Israel and Israel's journeys are described. We don't learn much about Moab and, uh, and, and the Edomites and all those kind of people in the area and how they worshipped and what they did at that particular time. That's the book of Numbers. And... Um, I want to encourage you once again, although we're doing this course in eight weeks, is on a weekly basis to page through the books that we are doing so that uh, you just get a feel for those books. And at the end of every lecture, I actually recommend some chapters in the Bible in these books that we are studying that you should read. And I do want to encourage you to, if you're not reading it word for word, or that you at least page through it and scan those chapters so that you can get a feel for the different books. The book of Deuteronomy, the last of the uh, books in the Pentateuch, um, the name is derived from two Greek words, deutero, which means second, or two, the number two, and then nomos, which means law. Uh, and it's based on a wrong understanding of the, of the Greek translation of the, uh, the Old Testament, the LXX, or the Septuagint of the Hebrew. And Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 18, there is mention of a copy of the law. But unfortunately, the translation took it as second law. And so the tradition developed that the first law was given at Mount Sinai to Moses. And then it was repeated again to Moses on the plains of Moab, which I personally don't think really happened. It's, it's simply a tradition. Um, I, I think what is happening here is that Moses is speaking. In fact, when you turn to Deuteronomy, it's very clear that Moses is almost giving his farewell speech the story picks up all the way back. It retells the story of Israel. Um, and when you look at the structure and scholars who have studied this from a legal point of view, uh, point out that the book of Deuteronomy actually follows a structure um, according to the treaties or the covenants or the contracts between different parties back uh, in those days. And uh, we don't have time to look into all of the detail of that. 
In terms of contents, we find the main sections uh, in chapters 1 to 33, that is uh, the bulk of Deuteronomy. And there are three different sections there. The first address is that of Moses, chapters 1 to 4. And Moses is simply looking back, he's retelling the story of the history of Israel. Then there's a second address of Moses, and in chapters 5 to 28, which is a long section, the covenant is repeated, uh, lessons from the past, a call to commitment, the laws repeated, the Ten Commandments are actually repeated in Deuteronomy, and then some other minor arrangements about how they should live some ceremonial laws and, and moral laws that are repeated for them. The third address, and the Acts of Moses, we find in chapters 29 to, three, to 33, uh, more of a historical review, a reminder of some of the things that went wrong, warnings against sin and how they should uh, live. We also have a song of Moses that is repeated here, almost like a psalm. It reads like a psalm. And then Moses expresses um, his blessing uh, over Israel. And then that leads us to chapter 34, which is pre preparation to go into the land of Canaan. And the reins are handed over in the last couple of chapters. Joshua is brought onto the scene. So in this sense, Deuteronomy functions as a transition from uh, the books of Genesis to Numbers. Uh, all the way, uh, the transition then over to Joshua because the scene will shift uh, as I pointed out in the little devotion earlier on already. Here is a picture of Mount Nebo, um, the mountain uh, to believe where Moses died. Um, and whether that is true or not, but, but tradition has it that this is where he looked at the land of Canaan and this is also where he eventually died. But Deuteronomy is simply a confirmation or a repeat of the law. Um, the, the importance of learning from the past is an important reminder to Israel. And, and we will pick that up again and again in the Old Testament, how we've got to learn. Even, even the New Testament talks about, uh, where Paul talks about the lessons from the Old Testament, where we need to learn about the mistakes that they've made. And they are there for us so that we can learn from them. An emphasis on love for and the fear of the Lord. It's an interesting combination. Oftentimes, we see f the fear of the Lord as a negative thing. Uh, but you can almost replace the word fear with worship, uh, if you really want to. For, for the Israelites, to fear the Lord was to worship the Lord. It was to revere the Lord. It was to respect God for who He was. And, and I love the book of Deuteronomy. It's full of love. Love God. There's a bit of a, a personal element uh, to the book of Deuteronomy, especially when you come out of Leviticus and Numbers, uh, because they are so legalistic. Do this, do that, do the other thing. But there are wonderful and beautiful passages in the book of Deuteronomy where we can learn from, even as, as New Testament Christians, uh, we can learn from that. The preparation uh, for the entrance into the land of Canaan and then also the handing over of the leadership. I have suggested some reading for you when it comes to uh, the five books of the Pentateuch and uh, please go through those as well. Now as we shift uh, gears we get into lecture number two, the historical books. And we have covered the period from the beginning, the year 2000 roughly when Abraham was called uh, all the way to about 1250, the Exodus, and we're now about 1230, uh, about ready to, to enter into the land of Canaan. Uh, against this map of the Middle East or the Mesopotamia, once again to remind you, Ur of the Chaldeans, as you follow up uh, through uh, following the river Euphrates, that's the, the route that Abraham traveled, and then all the way down into Canaan, which is, which is right there, um, and then uh, Egypt in the south. Uh, against that background, some of the important dates uh, we have looked at uh, before, so I'm not going to repeat it, starting with Abraham and dating everyone in lecture number one. We have actually looked at all those dates in detail. And in this lecture, we will be looking at uh, Joshua and then Judges, Ruth, and First and Second Samuel. And then uh, in the next lecture, we'll complete the historical picture uh, of the Bible. So tonight, uh, our dates will take us from about 1230 uh, all the way to 971, uh, which uh, marks the end of the reign of David. So we're going to go all the way to the end of David's reign tonight. Your reading, uh, your textbooks, and there are just so many things that you can look up either on the internet or in a Bible dictionary. Any one of the names in the books mentioned or 
the actual books and your Bible dictionaries will be described uh, in much more detail than we can do it here uh, in this uh, time together. When it comes to the genre or the literature types that we looked at, um, this is the historical section of the Old Testament. Not that we don't find hist history in the first five books in the Pentateuch, but it has become custom to refer to those five books as, uh, in terms of genre, literature type, we talk about that as the Pentateuch. Lots of history there, but now we're moving into the historical sections um, primarily. Uh, we're leaving the, the law, and in fact, that is what the Jews do. They refer to the Pentateuch as the Torah, or the law, because for them that is um, a particular literature type. But they continue to tell the story of Israel, and they're settling in the land of Canaan now. And for uh, this week and next week, we are going to focus on the land of Israel. In fact, beyond that as well, but in terms of the historical development of Israel, this is where we are going to be. In the Jewish canon, this section is referred to as the early prophets. It is an interesting reference because it refers to the fact that the Jews at the time and even today would look at history as God's story, as God's revelation. So history is not just events that happen. It is the way God operates. And it's an interesting take on it because it has helped me sometimes in my own life to understand God's working in my life as, as God's revelation, as, as God's working through my history. My history is not just happening. Uh, it is God operating through me and with me and journeying with me. And this is the way uh, the Israelites would have seen it or the Jews would have seen it. Now, what happened between Deuteronomy and Joshua? Very briefly, Deuteronomy serves as that transition, as I said, uh, and it looks back at what God has done in the past, and it's a, almost a necessary summary of the history of Israel in order to set the scene for the Jews or the Israelites now to move into the land of Canaan. Plus, the other transition that I referred to in my devotional uh, little talk earlier on is a transition of leadership. Uh, you can imagine... Um, how the, the Israelites became used to following Moses. They trusted Moses, and, and they needed to learn how to trust a new leader. And that is why Joshua was roped in by Moses, uh, and I believe God operated that way. God planned it that way. And Joshua traveled with, uh, with Moses in the desert. He learned from Moses. He was there at the tent of meeting. He went halfway up the mountain uh, when the law was given. And many different things that Joshua experienced and he learned by experience. And, and so I believe it was a fairly natural transition, but it was still a, a fairly big transition for the Israelites now uh, that Moses is dead and they need to learn to trust Joshua. As I have already pointed out on a few occasions, not all scholars agree on the date of the Exodus. So as you pick up different books, um, and this is just to caution you, uh, or to tell you that whenever you look at different books, you may find different dates. And the dates will differ roughly 200 years. Uh, either it's going to be about 1450 or so for the Exodus, and therefore also the conquest of the land of Canaan, or it's going to be about 1250, and then the conquest of the land subsequent uh, to that. Uh, be it as it may, all that it really does, it extends the time of the judges. Because by the time... Saul was Sol uh, um, when Saul was anointed king and David took over, we are able to date it fairly precisely, give or take maybe sometimes one year, five years, or ten years. But it's fairly accurate when you get to that particular point. So the only difference between the two Exodus dates is that, that the uh, time of the judges is extended by a 200-year period or um, obviously shortened by a 200-year period. In my particular uh, approach, I'm going to take the later date. And so by about 1230, uh, if you then add a number of years, another 40 years or so, it really means that by about 1270 or so, the Exodus, they left Egypt, and then they traveled around the desert for about 40 years. So the date is about 1230, and Joshua takes over uh, from Moses. It tells us the story of the conquest of the land uh, of Israel. Uh, we then go into the Judges. Uh, which is a time of turmoil, uh, uncertainty, lack of leadership. Um, leadership shifts from one person to another. And then the anointing of Saul, uh, 
David takes over, and from that point on, it is the lineage, lineage of David that really tells the story uh, of the rest of the Old Testament. And the book of 2 Samuel ends with David handing over the reins uh, to his son Solomon, and that takes us to about 971. That gives us a 260-year period that we're going to study tonight. In terms of the timeline and events, you will find them in your notes, 1230, the crossing of the Jordan, roughly 1220, 1220 to about 150, uh, or 1050 rather. It gives us about 200 years or so, the period of the judges. And as I said before, it's either 400 years or about 200 years. But then about 1075 to 1035, we have Samuel. And then 1045 to 1011, that's the reign of, of Saul. And then from David on all the way to 971. Some extra biblical references to this time. Uh, our main source of information is very obviously the Bible because the story has been written and handed down to us up to this point in time. Israel was not in the major focus of world events at that particular time. As opposed to the way I have personally grown up, I thought that Israel was the major focus of the universe at the time, but really it wasn't. Um, there, there plenty of, there's plenty of evidence uh, of, of other major world powers that dominated the scene, including the Egyptians at the time. So one of the questions is, do we have any other references to Israel before this time? Well, before this time, the, the answer is literally no, not up to date. No evidence of Israel beyond the Bible. However, there's a very interesting uh, reference in some of the Egyptian sources discovered in 1896 in Minerpta's mortuary temple in Phoebus by Flinders Petrie. A stella was discovered, which is a, a stone that has been either carved out or written on. Um, and the stella is a poetic eulogy to Pharaoh Minerpta, who ruled Egypt after Rameses the Great, roughly 1212 to 1202. So we're talking about the time of the conquest of the land of Canaan, or maybe short, shortly thereafter. Of significance to biblical studies is a short section at the end of the poem describing a campaign to Canaan by Merneptah in the first few years of his reign. In other words, roughly 1210 B.C. And here we have the earliest mention of Israel outside the Bible up to this point in time because no, nothing else has been discovered yet. But it says something like, and here is, this is in poetic fo form, it says, Israel is desolated, his seed is not. Palestine is become the widow, a widow for Egypt. Whatever that means is poetic type style of language. But the most important thing is that the name Israel is mentioned over there. And that goes back to just over 1200 years B.C. Now, let me show you a picture of that. This is a copy of that stone, uh, as you can see on the left-hand side. Uh, and it's all in hieroglyphics. And once they have been able to un uh, decipher that, uh, and I'm not even able to read that, not even by a long shot, but what you see on this um, stella over there, Right at the end there, in, in bigger form, and it's not that clear, but if you can read hieroglyphics, you will make out there something like Israel, and there it is uh, sort of explained to us uh, with a Y, S, R, I, and there's a 3 in the middle, and an R and an L. But it's a very clear reference to Israel uh, right there in that stone. Leads us to the book of Joshua which then tells the story of conquering Canaan and the dividing and the settling of the tribes in the land. Essentially, in the book of Joshua, we have two major sections. The one is the story of the conquest. One after the other, as they cross the Jordan, they take Jericho, then they take Ai, and then they take some kings, and there are many campaigns explained or described in the book of Joshua. And then the second part, the second major part of the book, is really about the division of the land. And uh, we'll look at that in a little bit more detail, but there's no real massive need for us to, uh, to stand still and talk about how the land was divided. In fact, if you do your quiet time reading, those are probably sections that you will skip 
because it's literally name after name after name, going through all the tribes and saying from this city to that city to this border to that border, this section belonged to Judah, this section belonged to Simeon, and so the list goes on and on. Not very exciting stuff uh, to read. And then the book concludes again with uh, some speeches on the part of Joshua, just like Moses in Deuteronomy, we now find Joshua speaking to the nation of Israel. Joshua himself, as a man, was the son of Nun. He was named Hosea, uh, which, is, which, which was a very common name, um, and it means salvation. When Moses roped him in as one of his uh, protégés or followers or disciples, if you wish, or helpers, he added the name Yah, which is the first part of Yahweh. And that is a very common thing that happened in um, the Old Testament and in the ancient world. Uh, the, the, the god Baal, for example, is often mentioned in a name. You would, you would name your child after your god, or some part of the name of God would be part of a name of your child. And that's exactly what has now happened. So salvation then becomes Yahweh saves, rather than just salvation, it becomes uh, God saves or Yahweh saves. Something I just need to explain to you, uh, if you are reading, I may have said this to you before, but if you are reading in your either NIV or any one of the, the modern translations, then the capital letters L-O-R-D translates the word Yahweh that we find. If you, if you read the word L-O-R-D, capital L, and then the rest in lowercase, then we are talking about the word, and I'll write this in English, Adonai. Adonai is a word like Lord or Sir, pretty much like Lord and Sir, or if you've heard the Greek word kurios, it's a, it's a very similar uh, meaning. It can mean Sir, it can mean Lord, it can mean Master as well. And, and uh, Adonai is a similar word to that. The Jews never pronounce Yahweh, ever. They, they, in fact, they shorten the word, uh, and even when they write in English, they leave out the vowel, and they just write uh, L-R-D, because they would never dare to pronounce the word Yahweh. Um, but that was not traditionally the case. It's as time went on and progressed, they were afraid that they might take the name of the, of the Lord, the name of God, in vain, and therefore transgress one of the Ten Commandments, and they were afraid to do that, and so they, they didn't read that word, or they won't read it. If they get to Yahweh, they'd rather read Adonai, because that's uh, acceptable to pronounce. Joshua played a major role during the desert travels. He was selected by Moses, Exodus 33. He uh, led the defeat of the Amalekites. It's a beautiful story. Some of you may have read that or, or, or heard that story where Moses was sitting on, on, on the mountain and Joshua was fighting the Amalekites down in the valley. And um, Moses, as long as Moses held his hands up, uh, they were winning the battle. But as, as he got tired and his hands lowered, then they were defeated in battle. And so Aaron and someone else came and they, they supported Moses' arms. And so that's the story that you read in Exodus chapter 17. He was sent out as one of the twelve spies, as I mentioned before and then appointed as Moses' uh, successor. And in Joshua, the end of the book of Joshua, we read uh, that he died at the ripe age of 110. The book and contents I've mentioned to you already. Um, we have Joshua affirmed as the leader, the spy sent to Jericho, uh, the crossing of the Jordan, uh, chapters 3, 4, and 5. It's a long section uh, about the importance and, uh, of, of crossing the Jordan, and it's almost like God needed to confirm Joshua as the leader. Just as Moses led them out of Egypt and the sea parted so that they can go through on dry land, in a similar fashion now, the Jordan dries up, and they are able to cross the Jordan while it was in flood. Uh, which is an interesting story, because um, the Bible, Joshua, actually tells us how it happened. Uh, way up the Jordan River, the banks caved in because it was in flood and the bank was undercut, as it were, and eventually the banks caved in and then it dammed up, as it were. And that provided, I mean, the, run, the, the water runs down towards the Dead Sea and that provided an opportunity for the Israelites to go over. So in a sense, it's not a miracle. The miracle is when it happened. It happened as the priests 
took the ark and they stepped into the water to cross the Jordan. At that very time, God allowed the Jordan to pack up and dam up further north so that the Israelites can go through. In the minds of the Israelites, that was just a pure miracle. And so Joshua was elevated in position in their minds, and they now knew that Joshua would lead them just as Moses led them in the past. Then we have the campaigns described in chapter 6 to 12, and then as I said to you, a major portion of the book 13 to 21 is all the division of the land, not the kind of things that you necessarily read. And then 22 to 24, uh, again, you pick up in your, in your quiet time reading because this is uh, some very good stuff where Joshua challenges the people in terms of their relationship with God. It is also here that we, that we have that um, uh, beautiful expression by Joshua where he says, um, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Maybe just to stop there for a moment and, and comment. Joshua takes an interesting approach. He says to Israel, uh, this is at the end of his own life before he leaves, before he dies. He says, um, I, I'm challenging you to do away with the idols among you. Now, immediately my ears pick up and I listen because already towards the end of Joshua's life, uh, the people were sinning against God. So it's an interesting um, phenomenon already. Now, that's nothing new because they've done it in the desert, they've done it in Egypt, they have always complained and so on. So always there's the struggle with sin in the camp, as it were. But Joshua challenges them and he says, um, you, must, you must serve the Lord, but if it is wrong for you, and I'm going to read from Joshua 24 verse 14, now fear the Lord and serve Him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods be, uh, your forefathers worship beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. There's an interesting approach by Joshua. He's actually saying to them, your forefathers, Abraham and his fathers and everybody else, worshipped other gods. But Abraham was not, Abraham's gods, or whoever, whoever the gods were that he served, they were not able to withstand when Yahweh, when he came and called Abraham. Abraham heard a voice beyond other voices. Don't ask me how, the Bible simply says that's the case. And so Abraham heard this voice, and he followed that voice. He followed Yahweh. And then 800 years in Egypt and the desert and everything else. Now they're into the land. They've conquered the land. And Joshua says to them, well, if you don't want to serve the Lord, why don't you go ahead and serve those gods that your forefathers served? Okay, but how about serving the gods of the Amorites? Now he says, as almost tongue-in-cheek, he's saying, you are standing in their land right now. You have taken their land. In other words, their gods were not able to withstand your God. So go ahead and serve them if you wish. But I know what I'm going to do. I know who is the most powerful. I'm going to serve him, my household and I. We will serve the Lord. And he mentions, mentions Yahweh. And if you read it there, it is the L-O-R-D capital letters uh, right there. The nations in and around Canaan that they encountered as they moved into the land, um, you may not be able to see this picture uh, clearly, but Israel during Joshua's time, uh, there are seven na uh, nations mentioned in the Bible. There, there are plenty of others as well. But we have the Edomites over here in the south. We have the Moabites um, just on the other side of the Dead Sea, the Ammonites. And then inside the land of Canaan as we've come to know it, the Philistines on the left uh, there, uh, which is Gaza, the city of Gaza, the Perizzites, Hittites, Jebusites, Canaanites, and all sorts of other types as well. But the Moabites, is, there's, there's a very interesting history here. Because the Moabites were descendants of Lot, the nephew of Abraham. So these people are connected to one another. It's 800 years later, but... They are somehow family of one another. They have obviously grown apart. The Edomites were descendants of Esau. Once again, it goes back to Jacob, another maybe 700 years or so before. The Ammonites were descendants of Lot's son Ammon. Again, they were descendants of Lot. And the Midianites, 
were descendants of the fourth son of Abraham that he had with Keturah. Some mystery again there, because Moses had more than one wife. Um, and, but Genesis 25 tells us this particular story. So, as the Israelites moved, they encountered some of their fellow nations, as it were, family nations. They were not totally distant from them. And therefore, some of the culture, some of the habits, perhaps even some of the language may have been common uh, among them at that particular time. The nations encountered in the land of Canaan uh, are mentioned in Deuteronomy 7 verse 1. Uh, whether we can identify them precisely uh, nowadays uh, is doubtful, but it's the Hittites, Girgashites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, Jebusites, um, and they are mentioned as seven nations larger and stronger than you. The word Canaanite eventually became like a collective noun almost for uh, a bunch of nations that, uh, or groups that lived in the land of Canaan at that particular time. On the screen you will find um, a satellite picture uh, that is taken from the north down south. So this is the Jordan River running, running over here. Here is Adam. That's roughly where the Jordan caved in when they, when they crossed the land, uh, or the Jordan River rather. And that is the Dead Sea over there. And this gives you just another little perspective with Jericho just on the other side of the Jordan here, uh, the hill country of Judah, um, and so on. There are all sorts of pictures that, that one can um, look at. In terms of the background of Canaan, uh, the people before the conquest um, who lived there were never one single nation. I think it's a picture that we need to try and get out of our minds. This was not one nation going to war with another nation. The people who lived in the land of Canaan were mostly, politically speaking, city-states. Jericho was a city on its own with a king of its own. And obviously you, have, you had fortified cities. Not every uh, town and city was fortified with walls around it, but many of them were like Jericho. There was a king inside. He ruled not only over the city, but also over the region around the city. And many people lived beyond the walls uh, of, of the city where they farmed. Um, they were peasants, and sometimes they came in for safety, especially if there's a war. If there's a war, then people... Uh, accumulated and assembled inside the city behind the city walls uh, so that they can try and, and fight the enemy or withstand the enemy. Uh, the religion, mostly what we would call polytheistic in nature, in other words, serving a multitude of different gods, some of which included uh, El. You may have seen the word Elohim. In fact, God is often in the Old Testament called Elohim. And that is the translation the translation for Elohim is actually God. It's the plural, um, Elohim, but the context tells you most of the times that uh, the word is a singular, that's God. But sometimes it's referred to as the gods of the nations, and then the exact same word, Elohim, is used for that. Asherah, or Asherah, is the wife of the war god Assyr, which was from Assyria. And then, one of the things that really became a thorn in the flesh for the Israelites is Baal. And uh, we find that again and again, and, and most of us know the story of 2 Kings chapter 18 with Elijah, or was it 1 Kings? Uh, Elijah encountering the, the prophets of, of Baal. Um, and, and Israel oftentimes... Uh, went away from God uh, to worship Baal. Baal was a, uh, the god of heaven and sun, and um, the prophets on that Mount Carmel believed that as they prayed, that Baal would be able to make rain come after the drought, uh, and so on. There were plenty of other gods, and so one of the distinct, distinguishing factors or, or characteristics of the nation of Israel was the fact that they only served one single god. And, and I think I've mentioned this to you before. In terms of the conquest, Israel entered the land from the east by crossing the Jordan into the central part of the country. From there they went south and southwest uh, up to the point where they encountered the Philistines. Um, they didn't go into the Philistinian uh, area much. Um, and then from that point on they started moving north. They never really 
captured the whole land. They never subjected all of the peoples uh, in the land. That is very clear, not only from the book of Joshua, but as we go over into the book of Judges, it actually makes that comment that Israel was not able to subject and to demolish all of the nations in the land. The success was a combination of God's intervention. I mean, you walk around a city and the walls cave in sort of thing. All the way to Ai, Joshua sent the spies, go fight them and you'll take them sort of thing. There was a bit of a mishap there uh, when they found the sin with Achan who took some of the stuff from Jericho. But at the end of the day, even when they, when they re-attacked, the second time attacked Ai, it was military strategy. Um, which God helped them to do, but there was no particular miracle around AI. So it was a combination of, of their own responsibility as well as God just stepping into the gap and helping them to do what they couldn't do on their own. There is a, a concept that we find in the book of Joshua that raises the eyebrows of, of modern people like us uh, from a, a humane human rights point of view uh, animal rights point of view, etc., etc., and that is the concept of total destruction. If you have any sort of Afrikaans in your background, the word banfluk uh, is the word, is a literal translation of the Hebrew. Uh, go and, and hit them with the banfluk, um, and that means go in, kill everything, everybody, and don't take a thing, and just burn it down. Now, if you think about it, you know, you read it on a page over there, but as you start thinking about it, uh, you think about not only soldiers who are there to fight and kill me, but there are wives and there are mothers and there are children and there are babies and there are animals. Kill them all is what God said. It's, it's a hard one for us to swallow, and I guess we will never really fully resolve the issue. But there are two things that, that one can... Um, offer as perhaps the reason why God needed to go this route. The one was the total unholiness of and the sinfulness of the people in Canaan. It's almost like uh, a Genesis 6 all over again. It's like the sin of the, of the land rose up before God and He's using Israel now to bring about His judgment and His wrath on the nations because of their sinfulness. The second thing is God knew what the future held. And that is that these very same people will become the thorn in the flesh. And so if you don't, if you don't take out all of it, then a little bit it's like, like um, um, leaven. And it will come back and it will start growing back again. And that's precisely what happened. Because the, they left so many of the people and the nations and the idol worship in the land that those very same things became the biggest temptation and the fall of Israel ultimately. So those are some of the reasons why we could say that God said to Israel, go in and demolish, annihilate whatever comes in your path. And, and it wasn't always the case. There are certain, certain cities that God said, take, the, take it out altogether. And others He said, go and you can take some of the land. You can even take some of the wives, it seems like. I mean, that's the impression one gets. When you look at this particular picture, it's the division of the land. That's in chapters 13 to 21. There are a couple of interesting things that I want to mention. The first is uh, Moses allocated this particular section, Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh, on the eastern side of the Jordan to those two and a half tribes. Now, we are never really told when those tribes eventually lost their foothold there and moved over the Jordan, because ultimately all you find is Israel on the western side of the Jordan. So when and how those tribes lost their foothold on that side, I don't know. There may have been some Jews actually living, continuing to live there. You may remember, this is the Sea of Galilee, you may remember Jesus traveling across to the other side. He certainly found Gentiles, but there were also some Jews who lived in that same region. Another thing that I want to highlight, which I will do later on, is that in the book of Ruth, which we will also look at, there seems to have been a very fluid situation because Ruth and her family moved to Moab, and they happily lived in Moab. The Moabites didn't kick them out, and they weren't criticized by the rest for going to Moab. In fact, the sons married Moabites, and Ruth is a Moabite, and she was eventually taken up into the genealogy of Jesus. 
So the situation in, the, in that whole region seems to have been a lot more fluid than we try and make it out in our minds. Another thing I want to point out is here is the area of Judah all the way to the south. Most of that is, is desert land, by the way. But Simeon res received its portion within uh, the region of Judah or Judea, uh, which was quite interesting. And there's Benjamin. Saul would eventually come from Benjamin. And David eventually would move uh, much closer uh, to that section when he captured Jerusalem. So I just, just hang on to that bit of information. There's Ephraim. There's another bit of Manasseh. And then the rest up there. Uh, if you count that, you will find 12 tribes. But you won't see Levi. So do you know what happened? Anybody? Joseph's two sons, Manasseh, and Ephraim inherited tribal regions of their own. So Joseph's tribe, one of the twelve sons, split up into two. And Levi is not there because the law said that Levi, the Levites, will be the servants in the temple or in the tabernacle, and they won't inherit a particular region uh, of their own. Some of the highlights from the book of Joshua. God encouraged Joshua to be bold and strong. We read that in chapter 1. God kept his promise. I, I highlighted that already. God led and provided for His people in miraculous ways, such as the fall of Jericho. Dealt harshly with disobedience. Uh, again, it's a concept that is very difficult for us to understand. Achan took some of the money, but he and his whole family and animals were stoned to death. So God had to deal very harshly with that situation to teach them a lesson. And then Joshua's farewell speech is a, an important one. And uh, we'll take a break um, for tea right now. Okay, the book of Judges. Um, as they conquered the land, settled into the land, um, we then read the story of the book of Judges. I want to challenge you to actually at some point read through the whole book of Judges. There are some very, very challenging and interesting stories uh, about those Judges. And then at the end of the book, the last few chapters, it's almost like you need an 18-age restriction on the stories that are told. And uh, th there's a particular background to that. Uh, the conquest of the land, the people spreading, as you have seen on the map in terms of the different tribes. Um, there are a bunch of desert uh, nomads who are now settling down. There are plenty of other nations or groups still living among them or in the cities. That's the story told in the book of Judges uh, and in Joshua. And, um, and that leads to some chaotic situation. And uh, my, my one word summary for the book of Judges is chaos. Uh, that is the general scenario. Now, they're wonderful highlights. I mean, we all know the story of Samson and Gideon, um, uh, Barak and a few others uh, in the story. But um, actually, when you, when you put the whole story together, it's one of chaos. In terms of the writing of the book, uh, the author of this book could have been someone from the time uh, of the early monarchy. It couldn't have been any earlier than that, and it probably is looking back at that situation and telling the story. It's named after the leaders that functioned, and they have picked up this name, Judges, or a judge, which really means uh, that they were ruling or reigning over a particular area. As I read through the book, I get the impression that those judges didn't necessarily rule over the whole nation from the north to the south to the east to the west, but they were more localized. Like Samson had a major problem with the Philistines, for example, and so he seems to be living in that area and tackling the Philistines. But somewhere in the north in Galilee and those places, uh, they may have been oblivious to the situation down south, as it were. And, and similarly, they're the Moabites sometimes. They are completely the other side of the Jordan again. And, and so on. Now, an interesting concept that, that really I have only learned about recently is that the word judge is normally uh, in our uh, understanding regarded as negative. In other words, God will come and He will judge this world. And then the picture of my mind is God will come and zap all the baddies. Now, what I'm learning about that is that the word judge in the Bible really means that God will reign and therefore, yes, he will punish the baddies, but he will also restore the goodies. Uh, 
and all those who are good. So God's justice will prevail. And therefore, he will judge over, like a judge in a courtroom. Uh, the judge is not there just to punish people. He's there to help set free or to uh, announce that a particular person is innocent. Now, if I'm the innocent party and the judge tells me I am innocent, then I love the judge. So from that particular perspective, the word judge is also a positive word and not just a negative one. And that's perhaps how we need to see uh, the judges. But it really tells us about the struggle for unification. These people have been nomads. They've been traveling together in fairly close proximity, dwelling in tents, following Moses. Now suddenly they're scattering over um, miles, uh, many square miles uh, in the land of Canaan on both sides of the Jordan. And what we read in the book of Judges is the struggle for unification and the struggle for settling into this land that God has given to them. That gives us roughly the background to the book of Judges, part of the problem. As I said, uh, we already picked up in the book of Joshua, is the fact that they have not destroyed the nations living among them. Um, as you read through the book of Judges and uh, partly J uh, Joshua as well, you will find those comments being made on an ongoing basis. Just by way of one quick example, um, the city of Jerusalem. Uh, it, you read in the book of, of Joshua how they actually take the city of Jerusalem where the Jebusites live. It doesn't take long before you read about Jerusalem and the Jebusites are there. They rule Jerusalem. And it goes all the way to David. It is only David after he reigned already for seven years in Hebron that he then attacks Jerusalem and he takes Jerusalem again. It's, it's just one sample of the problem of the nations dwelling within the land of Canaan among the Israelites at that time. Now, the Philistines in particular uh, created a problem for the Israelites during this time. They occupied the southwestern part of the country almost the exact same time, maybe give or take 50 or 100 years or so before the Israelites come in. Now, they encounter the same nations, uh, you know, the Hittites and the uh, Amorites and the Canaanites and the whatever tites in the same land, but from a different angle, from a different direction. But they settle in the land and the Israelites for years have not been able to actually subject them or to take them. They're not consolidated. Israel is not consolidated as a nation. And uh, chapter 2, in fact, chapter 1 is a summary uh, of that situation. But in chapter 2, we actually find a fairly sad state of affairs. It says in chapter 2, verse 10, After that whole generation had gathered to their fathers, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. Now, that's an interesting comment. And you may have heard the said that Christianity is always only one generation away from extinction. If the, if the next generation, if my children don't come to know Jesus and they don't follow Jesus, then they're away. And my, the next generation is gone and they begin to serve uh, other gods. And that is true of Christianity, certainly true of the Israelites at this stage. And you see it in this particular comment. Then the Israelites, verse 11, did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals. You remember the Baals or Baal? They forsook the Lord, the God of their fathers who brought them out of Egypt. They followed and worshipped various gods uh, of the peoples around them. They provoked the Lord to anger because they forsook him and served Baal and the Ashtoreths. In his anger against Israel, the Lord handed them over to raiders who plundered them. He sold them to their enemies all around, whom they were no longer able to resist. Whenever Israel went out to fight, the hand of the Lord was against them to defeat them, just as he had sworn to them. They were in great distress. And then in verse 16, Then the Lord raised up judges who saved them out of the hands of these raiders. Now, that's a summary statement of the book of Judges. From that point on, we now have illustrations of that particular scenario, how one after the other judge is raised up by God. Israel sins. Uh, they get to a point where they're totally despondent. They plead, pray to God. God sends them a judge. The judge helps them to get free. For 10 years, 20 years, 40 years, things will go well, and then the situation repeats itself. <laughs> 
over and over again uh, you find that particular story. Now, as you go through the book of Judges, it is not possible to actually find the chronology anymore. Uh, no dates are given. No, no uh, genealogy even is given. We don't know when Samson was born uh, and how he is related to Ehud or to Gideon and so forth. So it's not possible anymore to tell whether they have followed in exact sequence or whether that's just the way the story is told or whether some of them may have even operated simultaneously in different parts of the country. So that cannot be told anymore. I've mentioned the Philistines, and uh, they make for an interesting study. There are lots of mysteries around the Philistines. Uh, they are believed to have come from the island of Crete. They're called the Sea Peoples. Um, and in this relief, you will find uh, sort of uh, pictures of uh, some uh, Philistines on some relief somewhere uh, that has been uncovered, and I don't remember the details of that. But they came about 1175. They went down the Mediterranean, the coast, and they went all the way to Egypt. And they attacked Egypt. And the Pharaoh was able to withstand that, drive them back. They got back into their boats, and they traveled up north, or further, they traveled back north. And they, they, they explored the land, and they found the land of Canaan. And uh, that's where they started settling again. And the whole story is not known to us exactly, um, but... They, they settled, as I said before, around about the same time and became a major thorn in the flesh to the Israelites. Some of the general contents verse, uh, of, of Judges, chapters 1 and 2, the general conditions of the land, chapters 3 to 16, um, describe different Judges. It starts uh, with Othniel. Um, there's some wonderful stories over here. Uh, I think it was Ehud. Um, they, they needed to pay tribute to the king of Moab or the Amalekites, or who was it? I think it was the Amalekites. Um, and then Ehud goes and he pays tribute to the king, but he takes with him, he's a left-handed man, and he ties a short sword to his thigh on this side. And um, as he goes in, he asks for an opportunity to speak to the king, and the king was a very fat man. And so all the servants are being sent out, and while the door is closed, uh, Ehud then, and they didn't expect it because normally a person would pull the sword from, with this hand, but he actually pulls the sword with, with his left hand and pushes it into the belly of the king. The king was so fat that the fat actually covered even the handle of the sword, and then Ehud was able to get out. And there's an interesting comment there which really makes you chuckle, which is why you've got to read the book. Uh, the servants are waiting outside because the door is locked. In the meantime, Ehud is gone. And they're waiting and waiting. And they say, well, maybe he's just relieving himself. In other words, he's just going to the toilet uh, is really what they're saying. And so they wait. But, and to the embarrassment, and when they eventually go in, uh, then they find that he is actually dead. And then um, Ehud is able to uh, get all the Israelites into a war and they destroy the, uh, the enemy and so on. So there are interesting stories like that that you find in the book of, of Judges. But in chapter 17 to 21, we read uh, of a very desperate decay, a situation that goes downwards like you can't believe it. There are horrific stories there of how, people, how the Israelites served other gods. They appointed priests left, right, and center. You have stories of, of sexual molestation. I mean, all sorts of different things happening. And even civil war uh, among themselves and, and so on. You've got to read the story there to really appreciate it. Uh, as I said before, it, it really makes for almost an 18 restriction type uh, scenario. Um, here is a map where you can see some of the, uh, the judges like Otniel down in the south over here, Samson towards Philistia, um, uh, several others mentioned, there's Ehud uh, over there, and then Jephthah on the other side of the Jordan even, uh, there's Gideon, Deborah, um, and so on. Uh, so they, geographically there's a huge spread, and which is why they, we don't get the impression that there's one capital city and this judge is sitting there and ruling over the whole lot. And that in a certain sense sets the scene for the book of Samuel. Uh, so this is the background to the book of Samuel that we need to understand. In terms of an overview, uh, just listing them, you'll find Othniel fighting against Mesopotamia, uh, Ehud against the Moabites, Shamgar against the Philistines, Deborah, the Canaanites, whoever they were, uh, Gideon, the Midianites, and so the list goes on. Uh, 
And as I said before, Samson who fought against the Philistines. I don't think you've got this slide uh, in your notes. The message of judges, without God there is chaos. In fact, to me, it is ultimately the description of hell. I believe when God literally and physically withdraws himself from a place, it's hell. Um, the Bible describes it as a place of fire and brimstone and everything else, and I agree with that. I have no, no issue with that. But I do believe that when God is absent, we actually have hell, total hell. And, and here we find a bit of that. You're just a little picture of where God is not worshipped, where God is not honored, and where God is not present, then you have chaos. Disobedience has disastrous results. We've, we've got to understand that. Uh, God is in control. He can use any and every circumstance to further His kingdom. It's interesting to note that most of the people mentioned are normal, regular people. Gideon even regarded himself as some of the lowest. Uh, Samson was born with a purpose, but Gideon was not. Um, Deborah was just a prophetess, uh, a woman, and, and yet God used her to become one of the judges. And God sends salvation often only after people realize their need. Uh, this is the story of grace. It's only when we understand our, our total and utter lostness that we can understand that we need God. It's when people, and that was the problem with the Pharisees in the New Testament, they believed that they were good, and therefore God couldn't help them. Jesus said, I came to save the lost. The Pharisees felt that they weren't lost, and therefore Jesus wasn't really able to do much for them. And so it's when people understand their need that they turn to God and that God can then step into that situation. The judges also teach us very clearly that it is the Holy Spirit coming upon people and empowering them to lead them and give them abilities that they themselves don't have, which is emphasized in the New Testament by way of, of the Holy Spirit coming upon us and giving us gifts and enabling us to do what we cannot do in our own strength. Leads us to the book of Ruth which tells the very interesting story of one, one family during this time of the judges uh, and during a drought who picked up and left um, the area, Bethlehem area, and they ended up going to Moab. Uh, it's named after Naomi's daughter-in-law, uh, Ruth. Uh, the author of the book is unknown, but the time of writing is several generations later. In fact, uh, David's genealogy is mentioned in the last few verses of the book of Ruth. And therefore, this book was written beyond David, maybe even several generations after David, but certainly after David. And so it reaches back several hundred years uh, into uh, that particular scenario. The author, the author also needed to explain certain customs, uh, such as, uh, what has become known as leveret um, marriage. The ancient people and Israel, including, believe that the name of the family is born or carried through the firstborn son. And so the law stated that if a firstborn son has a wife and there's no child and the son dies, that the second brother needs to step in and take this wife and then have a child. It wasn't very popular among the people at the time because that child born is not the second son's child directly. It is really the family name. So if I, am, I just happen to be a second son. I have an older brother. So I would then literally make a baby on his behalf because he's dead and then he, that baby will inherit everything else because that baby is the firstborn son. So you can understand it wasn't exactly a popular thing to do. Now, this is the background, some of the background to the book of Ruth. Now, several generations later, this needed to be explained, something such as signing a contract uh, in those days, exchanging shoes. For example, I take your shoe and I give my shoe to you. That was signing the contract in front of the elders in the city gate. That is explained in the book of Ruth, giving the impression that this is several generations later when this practice uh, was no longer uh, being followed. But in terms of the contents and the outline of Ruth, very simple little book. Uh, chapter 1 is a drought in Israel. A family moves away. The husband dies. The two sons married Moabite women or wives. Um, the two sons die, and the only ones left is Ruth and her two daughter-in-laws, um, or daughters-in-law. And then 
she decides to go back because the drought is over, and then Ruth decides to go with her. And she makes a commitment not only to be with Naomi, but also to follow the ways of Naomi and Naomi's God. They come back, um, and Ruth meets Boaz, chapter 2 and 3. Turns out that Boaz is a family member, a distant family member, with no more close connection. Uh, Ruth then has the opportunity to marry Boaz, a family member, so that the lineage can continue, so that a son can be made in that line. But as Boaz investigated the situation, he discovered that there was one other family member who was closer related to to, uh, Ruth than he was. So he goes to the city gate in front of the city elders. He then negotiates with this man and he says, uh, you can have Naomi's property because you are the closest relative. That's the way it works. And he says, okay, I'll take it. And then Boaz has a bit, something up his sleeve and he says, well, if you take the property, you also get Ruth. And the guy says, nope, I don't want a Moabite woman and it will endanger my own inheritance. And he says, you, Boaz, you can have it. And so Boaz says, you sure? He says, yes, I am. So while the elders are witnessing, they exchange their shoes. And that's a done deal. So Boaz marries Ruth, and uh, he then gets the property of Ruth, uh, and then they have a son. And that son happens to be in the forefather line of King David. And that's ultimately the purpose of the story, is to tell us how David actually begins to appear on the scene. Um, And that is generations before God already had a plan. You may remember from our first module how we talked about God preparing the world for Jesus, uh, the, the birth of the Messiah. And this is exactly what God is doing, never losing control. And so somewhere in the middle, remember, Samuel is there, and he receives a request for a king to be appointed. And Samuel is highly upset because God is their king. They're a theocracy. They're not supposed to have a human king. And God says to Samuel, just allow it. Um, it, it doesn't look right, but just allow it. And God already had a plan because David was in the pipeline. Not the first king, but certainly the second king. And so the story goes. I have told you most of the background to the book of Ruth, uh, but it certainly happens during the time um, of the judges, the situation being very fluid uh, in terms of people moving around. In fact, I believe that situation probably continued for all the years of the existence of Israel. Some of the uh, interesting customs I've already told you about, the leveret marriage also provides us a bit of a background understanding of what has become known as kinsman redeemer. Uh, In other words, Boaz needed to redeem Ruth. And that provides us with a type, typology, uh, we call it. It's a type or an illustration in the Old Testament of ultimately ultimately what Jesus came to do, redeeming us from Satan's power uh, by saving us. The message of Ruth is very clear. God's provision and guidance during times of need. Ruth is a foreigner and yet she chooses Yahweh as her God, chapter 1, and then Boaz takes Ruth under his care just as God has done for us, and God's willingness to include women uh, in his genealogy. Uh, He's done that with the lady in Jericho, Um, Rahab is her name, just came to me, and then it's it's now happening with Ruth as well, and she's in the genealogy of Jesus, ultimately according to Matthew. Leads us to the book of Samuel, And Samuel, again, provides us with the story of uh, the end of the period of the judges. Samuel, in a certain sense, being the last of the judges, plays an interesting role because there's a bit of a combination of Samuel a judge, but Samuel a priest, uh, and then Samuel appointing the first king. And so that leads us into the very next massive stage of the life of Israel or the history of Israel. The writing of First and Second Samuel. Um, in the Jewish canon, we only have one book uh, called Samuel after the first character, the name of the first character in the book, that is Samuel. The Alex X or the Septuagint, the Greek translation, divided it into two probably because of length and did the same with, with Kings and Chronicles uh, because they were also just one book. And of course, tradition 
the tradition that Samuel wrote the book cannot be true. Samuel, Samuel's death is described um, in somewhere in chapter 15 or so, uh, and everything beyond that is beyond Samuel, um, and it finishes or it ends with David, and the story goes on into Kings, so it's obviously it couldn't have been Samuel, and we don't know who wrote the book. But the earliest date for the writing of the book can only be after David died in 971. The contents, there's a, there's a lot of overlap in what I'm going to tell you now, but in terms of the major characters, we have in chapters 1 to 4 uh, the story of Eli, the high priest, in Shiloh at the tabernacle. No temple yet, do remember that. Only Solomon or Solomon later on built the temple. Chapters 5 to 12, we have Samuel now kicking in. Of course, Samuel's birth is described, but Eli is the high priest. Then Samuel takes over after the death of Eli, and he is the leader of Israel. He is the judge of Israel, to use that term. And he is the one who introduces Israel to their first king, namely Saul. And then chapters 13 to 15, um, and there's a lot of overlap here, but essentially that the focus here is on Saul and his reign as he is the first king. He's the first one who's really trying. He's got a hard job. He's, he's trying to bring the nation together. And that's no easy task after the judges' era especially. But then in chapter 16 to 31, uh, David already is anointed as king, but he doesn't function as king. But the, the focus of the story is purely David. It tells about Saul, who's in the background, uh, but, but David serves Saul. Saul tries to kill David. David flees. Uh, and then lots of stories around David and Saul and David establishing himself and winning the, the, uh, the favor of the nation uh, as he's going around, more particularly Judah. And uh, Saul was from the tribe of Benjamin. If you remember that map, uh, it was round about the area of, of Jerusalem uh, and just south of that started the area of Judah. Uh, and that is where David had his, his major support especially initially. He fled into the desert. And if you visit Israel today, uh, one of the things you may do um, is actually go to the desert. And as you travel up from the Dead Sea, um, you will find some of those uh, wonderful fountains somewhere in the, in the nothingness. I mean, there is almost nothing. And there you find this wonderful fountain uh, where David was able to go and drink. And it's still there. And it's still fresh water. You can still drink it just literally um, out of out of the, uh, the ground. The background to Samuel, I've already mentioned this, but the chaotic situation experienced in the time of the judges actually needed to be changed. It, it, th there was no way for the next 500 years that things could have continued in the same way. In fact, Israel probably would have disappeared at the time. And so although the request for a king was seen by Samuel and probably by God initially, as wrong or sinful, it served a purpose. And God had a long-term purpose anyway, and so he allowed all of that to happen. There was no particular unified nation. Uh, they were all there. They, they had the law. They had uh, the tabernacle, Shiloh at the time, which is where it was. But then the Philistines in the southwest created major havoc, and that we've already seen in Judges. And they are in the focus also in Samuel. Saul, Jonathan, his son, David... All of them fought the Philistines because the Philistines seemed to be pushing further and further uh, to try and control the land. And there was need for a loosely uh, arranged, for the loosely arranged confederation of tribes to become a nation under one king. I'm going to take a closer look at the characters that we find um, in Samuel. Uh, the first one is Eli and the priest, uh, or the priest in Shiloh. The tabernacle is the religious center. It was in, in the town of Shiloh. Uh, he was a high priest, ruler, or judge. Both of them, it seems like there was some focus on, on Eli as giving direction to the nation at the time. But there was also enough evidence that uh, religiously and socially there was a major decline and therefore a need for change. Eli had no ability to control his sons or to discipline his sons. And here he was in the temple. He was now an old man. We are told that he himself was an overweight man by now. Uh, and he is in the, not in the temple, but in the tabernacle. And he appointed his sons as his priests, which was uh, what was supposed to happen. But these sons, 
stole meat from the people. You read the story in the first couple of chapters of Samuel. And they stole meat. They, 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 weren't, they weren't satisfied with the, with the regulation of the law where they would take a fork and push it into a pot um, and, and then take whatever comes out. They said, no, we want raw meat because we want a bride. We don't want it cooked. And so they changed the law. And, and Eli knew about it, but he never disciplined his sons. And furthermore, there were ladies serving in the temple, or in the tabernacle rather, and they, they had a jaw with these ladies. They slept with them. I had sex with him and so on. And he, again, Eli knew it. He said, my sons, this is not right. But he never really disciplined them. And so God spoke via Samuel to Eli and said, I'm going to take his name out of um, the equation ultimately. And so as a result of, of their behavior, the, the nation disrespected it. The tabernacle came uh, to disrespect God as well. Um, and then there's the story of um, Israel fighting the Philistines. It was back in the days of gentlemen's war. You know, we set ourselves up here and you set yourself up there and then we agree, okay, tomorrow we'll fight at uh, 10 o'clock. And so at 10 o'clock we fight, fight, fight. And um, it was one of those and, and, and the Philistines um, almost routed the Israelites. So the day is over, we go back to our camp and we scratch our heads and we consider. So the Israelites said, okay, tomorrow if we go back into the fight, we need to do something. So they run back to Shiloh and they gather the ark get the ark and they take the ark and then they shout and they say this is, the Philistines think all is, all is over for them but the next day again they won the battle against the Israelites and they take the ark back into their region and there's a long story about how they put it in their temple the temple of Dagon um, and, and how the Lord eventually punished them for all of that and so on but when Eli heard this story he fell over backwards uh, from his chair, and he died. He broke his neck, uh, and he died. And Eli's uh, sons also were killed in that same battle, and this left a, a huge vacancy or a, a vacuum, which is the vacuum that Samuel then was able to fill. He was now probably a teenage uh, sort of boy uh, as he was born into and grown up into the tabernacle. He became known as a person with a prophetic voice, um, and when we turn our attention to Samuel, his miraculous birth, we know very well with his uh, mother praying and asking uh, for a son. He was dedicated to God and he grew up in the tabernacle with Eli, experienced a dramatic call, heard an audible voice saying, Samuel, Samuel. Um, and ultimately, Eli helped him to recognize the voice of God. He became a priest, a prophet and a judge, a very unique combination. We don't find many of those in the Old Testament and uh, became a, a somewhat of a mobile ruler. He traveled, he had a home, but he traveled from one place to the other um, and then uh, pronounced the word of God or had a sacrifice someplace and so on. So he became a mobile leader for the nation. Um, and it's here that we start learning about the schools of the prophet. When we talk about prophecy much later on in the books of the prophet, uh, I'll come back to this particular story, but it seems like there were training schools where people learn to behave like prophets or to listen to the Word of God and to announce the Word of God. Interestingly enough, Samuel should have learned his lesson uh, when he was young and he, and he watched what Eli did and how God spoke to him about Eli, Eli's lack of discipline for his sons. And Samuel went the exact same route. His sons were not able to act um, responsibly and Samuel wasn't able to really discipline them much. And so it, all of this led to the nation coming and saying, we want a king. And Samuel therefore was used by God to anoint both Saul and then ultimately David as king. And then there's the story of Saul. Saul was appointed when the nation asked for a king. Samuel took it as rejection, but God said, allow it. The threat of common enemies during the time uh, with Moab, Ammon, Philis, Philistia and others around uh, really begged for a, some sort of action, and therefore uh, Saul was appointed. He started out so well. When they even looked for him, he was so humble that he, that he hid, and they had to go and look for him. And when they found him, uh, he stood literally shoulder and head above everybody else, head and shoulder above everybody. He was a big man. But he, it didn't last long before all of this went to his head, and uh, several things happened uh, to him. Uh, when you read the story, there's a very interesting comment that I cannot explain to you. And that is that God sent an evil spirit to live in Saul. 
God send an evil spirit. Now, modern day um, medical science will probably interpret that as depression um, of some sort or the other. But certainly when you read the story with the fluctuating emotions of Saul, from one moment sitting there being peaceful, the next moment grabbing a spear to actually kill David, they brought David in to play the harp, and the music seemed to calm him down. So you have some of those signs that, as I said, modern medical signs will describe in all sorts of different ways. But then he started getting very jealous of David, when, especially when David killed Goliath, um, and the people started revering David as opposed to Saul. Um, he started um, hunting David and wanted to kill him. Uh, his disobedience to God, when God sent him, to totally destroy that word again that we find in the book of Joshua, totally destroy the Amalekites. Sam, Saul went there. He didn't do it. He was disobedient. Several other things happened in his life to the point where God um, actually said to Samuel the very, very sad words, and that is, I have rejected Saul. And Samuel had the responsibility of letting, Sam, letting Saul know that he was no longer acceptable. That drove him up the wall even more. Uh, and by that time, he probably knew that David was going to be the one. Um, and so he, uh, he tried to kill David several uh, times. Finally, poor Saul committed suicide in a battle against the Philistines. He asked his weapon bearer to kill him, but he wouldn't. And so Saul fell into his own sword. And uh, he and his sons were killed in that battle with the Philistines. There's an interesting... Uh, uh, a modern little story that I want to add to that, because if you go to Israel today, one of the best uh, uncovered or recovered uh, ancient cities is that of Beth She'an. Um, the, if, you, if you get there, it's a, it's a large area, and you stand on a sort of a, an elevated area, you look over this whole area, and as I'm standing over here, uh, you look down literally main road Beth She'an, which is which dates from the Roman era, but underneath all of that is the city of Beth Shean. And Beth Shean is where, where Saul and his son's bodies were hung on a wall, uh, nailed to the wall, as a public display of the fact that they have actually captured uh, and demolished the Israelites. Um, and, and that particular visit is one of the highlights when you go to Israel, because to see what the Romans have done with that city, and now it's all been uncovered, and you can still see the main road with different stalls and, and everything else, and it, it really is a beautiful picture uh, in modern Israel today. But God rejected Saul. It is in this uh, regard that we find that very well-known saying or statement by God, uh, by Samuel rather. Uh, Saul was supposed to annihilate the Amalekites, he, and um, when, when Samuel came and he said, what, what, what is the bleating of sheep I hear? Uh, and then Saul said, no, no, we didn't annihilate everything because we brought some of these so that we can sacrifice the best to God. They actually kept the best. He was sort of half lying, I think he was. And this, is, this led to the statement that Samuel made. And he said, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the voice of the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice and to heed is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination, and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, He has rejected you as king. And so the writing was on the wall for poor King Saul. Leads us to David. David was prepared by God, there's no doubt. The rejection of, of Saul seemed to be a, a national and spiritual crisis, but God, again, is never unprepared, never ever. Uh, never caught unawares. So God found David. He was a pure, uh, poor shepherd boy at the time, the youngest son. Even Samuel didn't think he was going to be a king. I mean, Samuel arrived in Bethlehem, called uh, the father uh, and all the sons, and they line up, and uh, they all knew something was going to, to be happened. Something is in the pipeline over here. And so the sons come by, and the first one comes in is a, is a big dude um, uh, with with uh, beautiful features and everything else. And Samuel says to himself, this is it. This is the Lord's anointed. And God says another famous statement. God does not look at the outside. He looks at the heart. So all the sons come by, nobody. Is that another son? Yeah, there's a little one. You know, he's out there watching the sheep. They call him and here comes David. And David is anointed. Strong relationship with the Lord. 
uh, proof of which we find in the Psalms. Um, many of the Psalms have been written by David. We still sing them today. His musical abilities became an expression of his worship uh, to the point where he was even hired by uh, Saul's uh, servant so that he can play for Saul. And he showed that he had patience even after his anointing. And he knew that he was anointed. He knew he was the, first, he was the next king. He could have, he could have grabbed uh, or, or tried to, to take the kingship for himself. But he never did. In fact, on several occasions, he had the, um, he had the, um, the, the ability uh, and the opportunity to kill Saul. And he never did. He wasn't going to lay his hand on the, king's, on, on the Lord's anointed, he said. So the challenging story of David's anointing is told in 1 Samuel chapter 16. David rules as king. <clears throat> uh, this picture will become a very... Um, interesting one and also will become a, one that we will refer to again and again because as you see the major division ultimately and we'll talk about that next week is Judah in the south and what has become known as Israel in the north. Now up to this point in time in fact up to next week we talk about Israel as the whole nation. Israel leaves Egypt. Israel is in the desert. Israel conquers the land and then at the end of Solomon's reign at the split of the kingdom, the name Israel then starts meaning the north or the northern kingdom. We'll talk more about that next week. But there is Beersheba and there is Hebron on the map in Judah um, where David then, when he was anointed king, he ruled for seven years. But at this particular point in time, already there is tension. The northern tribes seem to have followed uh, and although it's not far away, but Be uh, Benjamin, where Saul came from, was located roughly around the Jerusalem area. And the northern tribes seem to follow Saul. And there's a lot of politicking going on, uh, strategic uh, gambling almost by David and so on. But David becomes king and he reigns over primarily Judah, because that's the following he has. But then through a few very important shifts that David was able to make. He got the military behind him, and then he won over the northern tribes. And as a result of that, and as part of winning over the north, he then goes to Jerusalem, besieged it, and then takes the city of Jerusalem and makes that into his capital city. And that was a strategic move, because that brought him closer to the area where Saul was dominant, and it was closer to the northern tribes as well. And so David was then able to consolidate the whole nation of Israel at the time. The sequence of events as David is appointed uh, is not exactly clear. There's uh, the description of Goliath. He was a three, three meter tall giant. Where that fits into the picture, uh, it seems like David was going back and forth between the court of Saul, the house of Saul, and, and uh, his father's household and looking after the sheep but then he served in in Saul's court then he needed to flee for his life uh, the other thing that is important in David's life is the close relationship between him and Jonathan um, one of the sons of Saul but he was declared king over the southern tribes and after seven years he became king over all Israel second Samuel chapter 5 in total he ruled 40 years a 40 year period and the Lord used him to really capture that whole region. He subjected Moab, Edom, um, all the way up to the Hittite uh, Empire, uh, Amorites, uh, Amalekites, and all of those uh, he was able to subject. In fact, David established a mini empire in that whole region, really, when you come to think of it. And that's what he left to his son Solomon eventually. Some of the features of his story include uh, his, his friendship with Jonathan, uh, the expansion of the empire, his ability to win the hearts of the whole nation. And then he was mentioned, or he is called, a man after God's heart. I find that quite challenging. And there's the difference between Saul, who also sinned against God, but he never really repented. He was sorry, but he was never repentful. And that's the difference between him and David. David sinned. But immediately he knew, and in his relationship with God, he repented, he knew he was wrong, and he tried to make right whatever went wrong. And it was a heart thing. Saul didn't have the heart. David had the heart. 
the heart to, be, to become reestablished with God. And he became the predecessor of Jesus. And it's interesting that in the New Testament, Jesus is often called the son of David. And that is the belief of the Jews, is that the son of David will be the Messiah, which we believe became true in Jesus. A couple of lessons. Hannah's prayer of faith uh, when Samuel was born. Samuel's leadership and total dependence on God. David's dynamic relationship with God. And then David's respect for Saul as God's appointed and anointed. The second book of Samuel continues the story. There's nothing to say about the writing of this book because they, they virtually are, uh, well, they are actually the same book. They have just been divided by the Septuagint into two volumes. There's clearly one author, and therefore it must be dated beyond David's death at some stage. In terms of the contents and the outline of Second Samuel, it's all about David. The establishment of David's throne in the first eight chapters. Then there's the description of David's rule in very realistic and also vivid terms, including the expansion of the reign, his sins committed with Bathsheba, the census that he did, which was not allowed. It was sinful against God to, to, to boast in the numbers, as it were. And then his unwise treatment of his son Absalom. When you read that story, there is no doubt that David was at fault in terms of the way he handled his sons. Uh, he was very extremely unwise, and that led to an uprising of his son Absalom, who then took over as king for a little while. David had to flee. That led to the killing of Absalom in a war, and David reestablished, but it never was the same again. David was now on the older side, and he really essentially left uh, a, a family in turmoil uh, by the end of his life. Um, there's some appendices. Uh, the last days of David in chapter, chapters 21 uh, to 24. A couple of the themes that you find in the second book of Samuel, the successful consolidation of the nation. This is really the golden era of the life of Israel. Uh, maybe I should say the first half of the golden era because the second half would come with, with, uh, with uh, Solomon uh, to some extent. And then Jerusalem and Judah uh, now becomes the focus uh, of God's activity. Uh, it's interesting, we can say this in hindsight now, but, but that's the line that we are going to follow. Ultimately, the northern kingdom will be destroyed, but the southern kingdom will continue, even through exile and the return from the exile, and so on, something we will look at uh, next time. And then, towards the end of Second Samuel, David is the one who wants to build a temple for the Lord, and he is allowed to prepare to do the groundwork for the building of the temple, but because he was a man of war with much blood on his hands, the Lord didn't want him to build the temple. Solomon had that privilege eventually. When you look at your required reading, uh, I suggest those chapters from uh, the books that we have looked at tonight, just to get a feel for those books, uh, but to do the reading, and even if you don't do the reading, at least just page through that, and then next week we'll look at the story of Israel all the way from Solomon uh, to the return of Nehemiah, to build the walls of Jerusalem. So, enjoy your week. May the Lord bless you.